All right. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining us on episode two of the Viper and the Dove podcast. I'm so excited to have Tony Fernandez from Broward Church joining us today. Um, Tony, how's it going? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm excited that I get to be on episode two. Look at me. <laughs> yeah, Ooh, top 10. One. Exactly, exactly. Now, I'm, um, we've been, well, we've been talking since like, well, we met back, we, we, we met over the phone. K. Sam Perkins introduced us That's right. back in December or something like that. Yeah, I think it was like November, but yeah. Maybe November? Maybe, yeah, something like that. Okay, okay. And uh, I was telling, K. Sam was telling me about how he wanted to, you know, grow and do some of the things that you guys were doing here in Denver. Well, what you guys are doing in Broward and how we could do it here in Denver. And he was like, you got to talk to Tony. And uh, I was like, okay, cool. So I got your number and hit you up. And pretty much on that call, you're like, hey, we're having a Broward workshop in January. You should come. I was like, okay. <laughs> so yeah, thanks again for uh, having me. There's a lot that has happened since, since then. Yeah, it was like prophetic, right? Like we, <laughs> we were trying to like get people set up for media. And, uh, and it's crazy the way that, that God kind of orchestrated all that because that is ridiculous. Yeah, it like, is. Several weeks later, we would, who would know that we would be in a quarantine and shutdowns and all the churches would have to figure out how to be digital. So That's right. That's so funny. Yeah. Okay. So you guys have been um, assist, essentially the leaders within our fellowship of churches, um, you know, or I should say one of the leaders uh, within our fellowship of churches when it comes to digital media for church, digital outreach for church what has been why okay there's a lot of questions i have and i know that a lot of it kind of ties into even just like who you are you know but also kind of like the leadership team around you and so i guess what my question is what allowed and enabled you guys to one what what was what was your inspiration for doing a lot of the media stuff that you guys are currently doing but then two like what has enabled the Broward Church to go so far and lean so heavy into this direction. Yeah, I think what you said is 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 um, flattering. Certainly, we think that there are other congregations who are also trying to kill it, and um, and we're learning from them um, just as much, if if not more so than than they're learning from us. And so um, we've we've uh, yeah, we've, it's been awesome to kind of be in the same boat, um, trying to accomplish the same mission. Uh, but yeah, I, I think. Like overall, the philosophy here in Broward is that um, we, and I always say this whenever I like get a chance to teach something, like we believe that like the internet is a place. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a, that was a shift. You know, we, we believe it's a place. It's a place where people congregate and people find real community and where they have, you know, like talks about politics and, and things that you used to talk about in the, you know, barbershop or not happening right. on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or WhatsApp or whatever you use. And, and I think those conversations, those discussions um led us to to believe that that if it's a place then we have to go there mm -hmm. um, if we are to go there then we have to go there in a as your hat says a native way you know it, mm -hmm. it, needs, to be, it needs to be native it, it just we have to know the culture and 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 so, so, so that was the vision behind it. And then I think the implementation came about, as you said, like when we, when I was able to pull around uh, me, a great group of people who care about this much more than I care about it, because mm -hmm. in any way I'm, I'm a newbie to it. Like I, the guys on my, on my media team are constantly telling me to post on Instagram. They're like, Hey, can you like, <laughs> can you put something up there? A picture of your family. I'm like, Oh, that's you know? hilarious. So, but th these guys are super involved, and and I think if it wasn't for the guys um, that that meet with me, um, I we would have no idea what we're doing. And so, mm -hmm. I think the so not only the implementation from the people, but I think the support. Like so many so many congregations are dealing with this now, trying mm -hmm. to um, balance uh, how to be a traditional church yes. with traditional standings, with traditional doctrine, with also being forward thinking in reaching more people. Right. And, that is a difficult balance, but we have an eldership that really um, respects the job that we do, um, mm -hmm. and we respect the job that they do, which is in many ways like liberals and conservatives trying to fight. You know, like <laughs> like keep it the same. We're all progressive. Move things forward, and and that balance, um, that that kind of working together on this is is really what I think makes our um, community here in Broward very special. 
Yeah, I agree. I agree. And when I was out there with you guys in January, I looked around and I was like, everybody's like my age. <laughs> like your entire, your entire group is like a bunch of youngins. What, what would you say is like the average age of your guys' staff? In Broward. Oh, man, I don't know. We, we got young. We got young really quick. <laughs> we're, we're agile in our payment strategy. Yeah. There you, like, <laughs> there you go. Cheap, man. So, so yeah, we're, we're, we're a young group. Um, uh, yeah. I like, I don't even know what the average is because we do have some people that are, that have got history and totally. they, they, they work uh, tirelessly. Um, but I can't even give you an average age cause I'm so bad with like numbers off the top of my head. But if I had to guess, I'd say it's like, 30 you know maybe okay, okay. I was gonna say like under 30 probably yeah, yeah. but the, the crazy thing though is that like because that's not normal uh within our you know churches and I would probably well I don't know about like other you know other larger churches and things like that but I know that there is definitely that generational tussle you know like there's always the the um the talk, the conversation, there's always a conversation about how do we hand the baton off to the next generation successfully. Um, and so it sounds like you guys at Broward have really done that. Um, you've talked about this before, but kind of tell me about like who handed the baton off to you that really kind of gave you and Cassandra, your wife, the opportunity and responsibility to really um, captain the ship for Broward, for Broward Church. Yeah, I, I've, I am certainly a student of the people who have come before me. Um, and I, I think about this idea of passing the baton as kind of a, a choice that, that we feel like we have to make that's not really even the right illustration. Okay. Um, but, but I know that, that way of thinking of it, you know, like passing the baton. But, but for me, it's not like a, you know, you go from one person to the next person. It's actually an addition. Like mm -hmm. that, that's what you have. You know, you're building upon something. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so when our elders or, or the people who came before me, they established something that was really firm and I got a chance to build upon their, their foundation. Right. So often, like, like young guys, especially like me, you know, I came in this way too. It was like, let's just blow the whole thing up, you know, let's like start <laughs> from zero, start our own church, you know, it'll be awesome. It'll be, but, but I realized very quickly the, the lack of maturity, um, that, that the lack of maturity that's involved in a decision like that, mm -hmm. um, blow things up because because there is so much good that has been laid um, from the generations before and so I think even in our leadership you, you sort of we, the person that trained me in the ministry initially um, is John Porter uh, John Porter was was awesome and he, he taught me kind of this idea of a permission giving structure okay which, which is that if you're gonna if you're gonna like if people have an idea laid on them by the Holy Spirit you you have no right to say no, you know, mm. um, you can say not in this time or not right now or try to maneuver a way for it to happen. But, but, but we have a permission giving structure, which means that if you're an intern in our group and you're like, and you have an idea, you can bring it to the table and, mm -hmm. and it, it should be as received, well received as the elder's idea. That doesn't necessarily mean it's as approved as the other idea. You know? <laughs> we have right. a permission giving structure within, within what we do because everybody has the Holy spirit. Everybody who's baptized, um, Everybody God living in them. And then I think, so the next person to really do some training and some, some um, forging of my leadership was Marcus, um, well, Marcus and Amy Overstreet. And Marcus and Amy Overstreet um, kind of taught us this idea of loyalty, family dynamic, that we were going to have fun, that staff meeting, we were going to laugh, that we were going to joke about each other. And yeah. th those things were, were, were caught for me. Um, and so, you know, hey, okay, so I added to the equation. So it's not just a permission giving structure, but now we have this loyal family mentality. Yeah. And then I come from kind of an artsy background. I do music and all that sort of thing. And, and so I came, Hey, we need to do creative initiatives. We need to be creative. We need to like, God is creative from, as the song, so will I says from no point of reference, he spoke to the dust and fleshed out the wonder of life. From no yeah. point of reference, he created everything. And so I brought kind of a, a creative vibe. And so I, we take those three things and I think you've established the, the culture in Broward. And so mm -hmm. again, it's not a passing of the baton, but truly a building upon a structure. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's so funny what you were saying earlier. Uh, yeah. I just want to go in and blow it up. And I was like, yeah. And that's why the older folks don't want to give, don't want to pass anything down. <laughs> so <you said> it. <laughs> So. <laughs> <laughs> that's great um well okay so you guys have done like i said you guys have done a really good job you were being very humble earlier you were like um oh yeah no we're we're one of the groups now you guys have definitely spearhead 
Um, and, and, you know, if I can give my observation, um, one of the reasons I believe you guys have, and I look at the groups of churches that have, um, that were prepared for COVID is because they wove those baskets many years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not like they bought a bunch of equipment and all of a sudden, you know, they were banging out live streams and, you know, services that looked gorgeous, uh, you know, and not just looking, but, you know, really engaging and all those kinds of things. Um, what, so talk me through, and I've talked this about this with the, um, the brushes a couple of times in different uh, conversations I've had with them. The brushes are, um, John and Pat brush, uh, one of your guys is eldership couples, uh, in, in Broward, but like, because a lot of churches struggle with this, right? Like you guys were the first to say yes to me um, when it comes to allowing my team to come in and um, be a part of your team, really, uh, and, and help in any way that we could. But a lot of churches um, tend to, the, 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 the default is, you know, that's not really in a budget or, you know, there's always this element of, you know, uh, I don't know that this is really a priority, really, is what it how it kind of comes across at least to me and so how and why i know you guys talked you talked about the you know the internet being a place but that's great but you've also made you know you've you've put your money where your mouth is at the uh, so to speak right you guys have really invested not just like time and talent but like dollars <laughs> um into this area talk to me about like how and why you guys have decided that this is a priority before COVID. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we've, so, I mean, it was so cool because I think the, sh we stopped our service. We had this discussion. I don't remember the date, maybe it's, I'm thinking March, first week in March or something like that. We have this discussion about whether or not COVID is going to shut down our church. And we're debating with the elders. I'm on the phone and, and we make the call on the 12th, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that's a Friday, if I'm not mistaken, that we aren't going to be able to have service make the call on the Friday by that Sunday. Like we had the live stream set ready to go. It was like, it was like, and it was, you know, it's basically the same live stream we're doing now, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it was totally like, we felt like Joseph, you know, like, Oh, we had prepared for a famine and then God, you know, in a dream told us. And now here we are being able to not only take care of ourselves, but also take care of other churches and supply yeah. them with worship songs and, and sermon series and all That's those right. sorts of things. So, um, Anyway, so so the the question about budget, I think, um, comes is in line with the motto that we have as as a church. So mm. um, we have this motto that that we took from um, uh, Timothy Keller's book, Circle Church or Center Church. I can't remember what it's called, but but it says um, that he, he he writes this line. Maybe it's a head of a chapter, but it says that we would be a church not for ourselves. Mm -hmm. like, That's exactly it, man. I like highlighted it, circled it. You know, Juan, our our graphic guy, just like made an awesome picture of it. I'm like, that's that's the vision. We're a nice. church. Not for ourselves. And I think the reason why we're willing to spend that money is because we understand that the money we have is really, um, or the church that we, who we are is for the benefit of other people. Yeah. And so like, we don't view online presence as a medium for getting more clout. Um, mm -hmm. We don't view the online presence as a, as a mechanism for being more famous. We do not view being online or being on Instagram or getting more followers as a, as a mechanism for, you know, some credibility for the church. It's none right. of those. For us, it's all about seeking and saving that which is lost. Yes. It's all about encouraging the saints for works of service. It's, it's all about those core biblical principles. And so when we began to think effectively and going how, or think about effective effectiveness and going, how do we effectively reach more people? How do we effectively equip the saints for works of service? Mm -hmm. We went, well, the internet is the perfect place to do all of those things. Yeah. Like I can have somebody go out on campus, you know, pre COVID and you know, if they're really evangelistic, they can reach a thousand people in a, in a, in a week or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if, but if, I can make a video in like 30 minutes, you know, we can edit it for another hour and a half or we can reach 10,000 people. That's right. So like, yeah. like uh, it doesn't make any economic sense for me to send uh, again. I all, I'm all about campus ministry. Amen. But you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like yeah. for, for, for us, the, the, the decision became just so incredibly obvious. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, re the reason we were able to do it is because we were not compelled for, about with clout, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think many of the, 
of the people who are building these. And I have, I've had these conversations a lot. They, they talk to me like, man, we need to get our followers up. I'm like, why? <laughs> right. Like, exactly. You know, like what? Yeah. And I, I just think right. we're, we may be missing the main point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and as you know, you guys are a part of our uh, church media accelerator program that we, um, we launched back in June and we have seven churches uh, actually, I actually haven't talked about this on the podcast yet, but we have a, a program and it, we have seven churches and it's, it's essentially, it's a, it's a pilot program um, because, you know, within our fellowship of churches, uh, this is a new, uh, this is new territory. This is a new domain. Um, and, you know, we are working with the churches to help establish their teams, understand their processes, understand again, even what you just said, understand what are we actually trying to accomplish? We're not looking at how many new followers you have. Great, maybe that's an indication of uh, the people who are um, committed and want to join and be a part of your community. Um, but if they're not engaged, then sure. why does it matter how many followers you have? Um, and so talking a lot about that, and a lot of the churches have actually, you know, come to us and reach and ask like, hey, well, we, you know, um, what is Broward doing? And I'm like, you know, a couple things. This is what Broward's doing. Broward has decided that this is important. Like, if you're not gonna, it, it's like working out. <laughs> you know, I can say to myself, man, I really want to lose, you know, 20 pounds or whatever the case is. But if I'm not actively pursuing that and taking the steps to actually doing that, then it's just not gonna happen. Um, but then also, um, you guys actually have like a plan and you've, you've been intentional by having a team that is actually dedicated to doing this, um, which I think has been a great example, honestly, for our churches, because I've seen a lot more churches over the months, especially in the COVID period, that have decided to um, take that leap of faith, essentially, and um, decide to, you know, bring people on so that they can be focused, because this is a ministry. Mm -hmm. This is a ministry. So, yeah. Um, I'm pumped that you guys have really been uh, a light in this yeah. way. Thanks for your program and all your help. I know our guys are are eager um, to to continue to learn from from you and your team. So it's been it's been awesome. And you guys have been patient with us. It's a uh, you know there's been a couple of iterations of uh, you know the program and and uh, you know in my mind it was so funny because I you know was talking to Roger Lamb and um, Justin Renton at Disciple saying. I was thinking like, oh, this could be like a great program for like everybody right now. <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, it, I think very much with COVID happening, it really, ex it kind of sped everything up by like two years. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a great, so we're, we're grateful that you guys are a part of it for sure. Yeah, sure. I think something else that I was thinking about, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not even sure if it's related necessarily, but as you were talking, I was thinking about like, we've invested in it. I think the other thing that I've been, Tuan actually said this, our, our graphic design guy said this on Thursday during our meeting, uh, which I thought was just so, was so true. He said that um, the way we view um, uh, like Instagram, for example, or Facebook or whatever, it's like another teacher, hmm. uh, another teacher of the gospel. And, and um, That's you know, cool. the passage tells us that, that not very many of you should ought to want to be teachers. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a spirit of like, sometimes uh, the churches kind of jump out and just kind of like, just, just ride the wave. And that's the whole game. You know, it's mm -hmm. like meme posting and whatever. Um, and, and certainly that's, a, that's, a, that's a way. Um, mm -hmm. But I think in, in, we, we're trying to establish kind of like an intellectual Instagram, <laughs> you know, like yeah. a, one that speaks a little bit less to just like games and whatever, and, and much more like a teacher. And, and if you're going to have a yes. teacher, I mean, you have to have someone that's biblical literate, that's Bible literate, that's whatever. So it's not just training young people to post for your brand and color yeah. schemes, but it's like teaching them to be biblically literate um, so that they can mm -hmm. then post things that actually do speak to the truth of the gospel. That's right. That's right. Well, I mean, they are, they are the voice of, yeah. of for you guys, for Broward Church. Um, but if the mission is to drive people in and, you know, find seekers, essentially, um, then they have to speak that out into the, uh, into the Instagram universe. Yeah, yeah. And I see that it's, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting, right? Because like your personal Instagram 
is a voice for you. Yes. It's a voice for you in your own life and going, this is the image I want to capture of myself. Right. And similarly, the Instagram of the church is a voice for the church. It's, yes. it's, and in the world that we live in now, especially, it's the first look that they get of your church. Yes. But so if, if people are hopping on and, and, you know, they just, I don't know, they're just seeing like, the same thing over and over again, or they're seeing the, the minister as kind of the celebrity or like all those things are playing into the aura of, of the voice that you're, that you're sending out there. That's right. And I, we, I would, per, yeah, I'm pursuing a much more cautious tone. Mm-hmm. Uh, even, even as it relates to all that's going on in our country, just a much more like um, clear, like clear points, not just like hyper posting um, in order right. to, uh, obtain more followers. And so I, I don't know how that's related to anything you're talking about, but I, uh, but it's just something that was on my mind. Well, no. And I think that, you know, <clears throat> you know, there's always, I do this for a living, right? Like I, I, I train and, and implement strategies for organizations to grow their brand or drive awareness to their brand or whatever the case may be. But the thing that um, what you just described is a very like mature, longer, uh, longer game perspective on social media because sometimes there is a time to say a lot and then sometimes there is a time to be silent and to just absorb what's going on around you and I remember actually talking to I think it was Twan or um, I can't remember who it was but um, they had mentioned with um, the the death back in um, was it in June or George Floyd, George Floyd. Exactly. And, you know, there was a lot of, um, there were a lot of churches. This was the first time that actually I felt like I had heard so many churches, not like a statement made from like the top, but like individual ministers on their Facebook pages or on their Instagram accounts, um, black, white, Latino, Asian, like a whole spectrum of different ministers and not just ministers, but also just people in churches and things like that who had, who, who wanted to make sure that they weren't, um, cause I think the painful part that has been a part of this for so many years is that there's been so much silence. And so I don't know, I felt like it was a combination of things. I felt like one people wanted to make sure that people heard them say something publicly because especially in a world with COVID where you, you can't speak directly to your congregation at the, from the pulpit Right. But then two, um, I think there was also a freedom. I, what I, and I don't, I've actually spoken to anybody to confirm this theory, but it felt like people felt free to actually communicate what was on their heart, the unfiltered versions even, uh, for better or for worse, <laughs> um, on social, which to me, my perspective was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. And, you know, of course on social, you're going to get like commentary and, you know, people, you know, sometimes maybe argue a little bit, but overall, I was personally really encouraged. Yeah. I feel like we, the culture that we're living in has, um, has made it so that the news in Minnesota is the news in Broward and the news in, in Miami is the news in, in Denver. And That's that's just the way it is. And, um, and I think we have had to make adjustments on the way that we think about the world and on the way we talk about the world. And, and I think to go back to that idea that not very many should be teachers, I think that you're right, that sometimes, um, the posts were, not right, <laughs> uh, for, for lack of better for lack of better phrase, uh, and, and other times the the posts were um, were were perfect, you know, and or just you, who you are and what you're feeling. And I think um, the church, however, had a, has a voice during those times, and yeah. and I think we are still in many ways trying to find our voice. Yes. Um, because what does the organization um, that is known as the church exist for? And I think we have to continue to wrestle with that. And, and I think that those decisions in, in are, need to be made in due time and need to be made with working things out with fear and trembling and need to be made through prayer and fasting and consideration and, and much more conversation um, than, than simple Instagram, you know, um, black squares. And though I think a black square is fine. You get what sure. I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. That if we're going to find our voice, um, and I, for me, I'm all about the, the vision of, of not just um, 
not, uh, you know, we use this term, you use this term too in social media, kind of riding the wave, right? Mm -hmm. Not just riding the wave for more clout, um, mm -hmm. not just kind of following the news cycle in order for us to have a name in the middle of the news cycle, mm -hmm. um, but instead actually stopping and going, okay, what do we need to learn from this as a congregation? Right. How does the voice need to change as a congregation? Who do we need to do? What, what real groundwork needs to be laid so we can become who we ought to be? And, and that doesn't just happen. It could be sparked by an Instagram post, but that doesn't just happen on an Instagram post. You right. know? Like, oh, this is a post. Now I've done my duty. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> we missed the whole point. Like, I'd rather you not post and do yeah, what yes. you're supposed to do. And so I think all those things have kind of been um, weighing on us as we've been thinking about the election coming up, as That's we've right. been thinking about like who we're supposed to be with, with, um, with race, who we're supposed to be with gender and, and kind of dealing with some of these more difficult issues and, and going, okay, what does the scripture say? Cause we are still people of the book. That's what, right. what, is, what is God's spirit has, what has he impressed on our hearts? And then, and then what does clear good counsel tell us as we talk to more people? And, and then from there, we will have words that are actually meaningful um, that are not just pandering. Um, and right. I, I'm, I'm like, so about that. And it's so funny because sometimes in the silence or in that, um, slow to speak idea. Um, it seemed as, as like not caring, but in, in fact, I think being slow to speak sometimes shows that you care a lot mm -hmm. if you will eventually speak. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because <clears throat> there's been so much trauma, I guess you could call it this year. I think that's the word. Yeah. It's, it's just been piled on <laughs> this year. That meme, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> And it's hard to even process. Like, it's just difficult to even, like, and because, like, the next thing happens and then the next thing happens, it's it, it almost feels like you never really get a chance to either grieve or, um, again, process or just kind of go through it's almost like you're constantly uh we're our bodies are meant to be able to heal if i get a scratch but if i keep getting scratched it's not gonna heal uh or it's gonna heal really ugly um and i feel like this is the year and i feel like this is um you know i'm, I'm really kind of curious to see and i think i don't know i think that we i'm not a i'm not in the ministry um not in the traditional sense but sure. i think that like sometimes there is this over expectation of like ministers just like fix my life. Uh, mm. Have you ever heard that show um, from um, Oprah's network, uh, Ileana fix my life. <laughs> it was like go on to her show or go to church and like show all of a sudden just like fix your life. And I guess like, what have you seen just like within your own congregation of how people are processing um, mental health, all of those kinds of things. Um, and what have you guys been doing as a church to just kind of support and foster that sense of yeah. like healing? Man, I, I think your question um, and the way that um, the context of it is, is perfect because I think you're exactly right. This is a year of scarring. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the cuts have been deep and they have been many um, and they seem to be relentless. Um, just keep continuously just pouring on us. And, and I'm telling you, I believe the biggest one is coming in November mm -hmm. uh, as the right. as division of our country and the division of the church um, becomes ever present um, in, a, in a clearer and clearer way. Um, and so I think this year has been a blessing. Mm -hmm. The reason I think this year has been a blessing is because it has toppled everything we have put our hope in. That's right. So if you, if you put your hope in like, you know, the government totally toppled, you know, because they, they like yeah. can't seem to pass a second. Looking to the left, looking to the right, it's like no like, hope. Like, yeah, you have no hope. You know, like they can't seem to agree on anything, you know, yeah. there's our vacation or whatever. as like the look at the American suffer, you know, like, and I'm not even a political dude. And I'm just like, this is, this, it's crazy, you know, yeah, yeah. If you, if you put your hope in, if you put your hope in kind of like um, normal institutions, like like going to school and participating yeah. in work and, right. and hanging out with your friends, all that's just been utterly toppled. Sure. And, and what you're what you're left with is this feeling of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And I think that feeling of hopelessness is the trigger for finding true hope, mm -hmm. because you never think about hope unless you feel hopeless. Yeah. 
when you have, when you feel totally, perfectly hopeful, you never think about hope. Mm-hmm. You know, when everything's wonderful, you never think about it. Right. And when everything falls down, you begin to feel hopeless. You go, wait, I have put my trust in all these totally dilapidated buildings. Mm-hmm. I've placed my hope on top of them and they have just totally crumbled. Yep. And, and now I get a chance to reassess. Now I get a chance to go, okay, what is still standing amongst the rubble? And the That's only right. thing still standing is the cross of Christ. Yes, the only yes. thing still standing is Jesus. The only thing still standing, hopefully, is God's word uh, manifesting through the people of God. Like those are the only things that are supposed to be still standing. Mm-hmm. And when you look at somebody and you're like, wow, they're happy. You're like, oh, they love Jesus. Like yes. that makes sense. And so I think that this year has been a blessing in that regard because it's allowed us to just pause for a moment and take stock of our life. And we don't often get that because we live in a great country. We live in a country that, that gives us everything. We live in a world that, that seems to be, you know, year after year getting better, you right. know? And, and so, and so now it's terrible and we get to look around and go, Oh wait, that's still standing. And it's Jesus. That's right. You know? So I, I, to me, that's, that's been awesome. And so that's what I've been trying to point our church to, mm. um, and, and it's certainly been hard because it, it, your hope begins to waver slowly. You know, it does, it's not like a, it's not like it happens in a, in a moment, you know? Well, and I think even just in my own life, like I, <clears throat> I put a lot of hope in, you know, honestly, even just, even my ability to hang on, right. Like uh, to endure um, and like, I like being strong. Like, I like being capable. Um, I take pride in um, things not going well and yet still being resilient. I take pride in, like, my resilience. And yet, like, this year, I'm like, dang, sheesh. Like, Jesus, God is like, God is like, oh, we're going to start the new, this new decade off right. Like, everyone's getting stripped down, like, like just naked, like, and it's been good. Like it's been, I, I just recently put a post out um, on, on Instagram or something and just was talking about like how I, you know, so I run a business and, you know, it's been going really well and growing, but like, even when God shows that like, he's still going to take care of you, even when things are crazy in the world is like, there's, I am just like hardwired and I really would love to, I I want to really learn that contentment that Paul talks about. Um, But like, I just get in, I, I, as I like, after I process a little bit and I'm like, dang God, you like totally took care of that. Like, it's Mm -hmm. just like embarrassing, (laughs) like over and over again. I'm just like, shame on you. Like you just, it's, it's hard though because we're just so just designed to like think of the next thing next thing next thing and um this has just been such a great opportunity this year to really um to really strengthen um my faith in even the things that are you know this has been a crazy like seeming like seemingly terrible year so actually i just got um i just tested negative after having COVID for like the past uh, wow. two weeks. And, um, and so just being grateful. Yeah, we are. Yeah. It's, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I know this is so bizarre to say in the midst of so much terrible, but, but again, I feel, I feel grateful for, for this time. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we would have gotten it any other way. Right. And I don't, I, I mean this with all honesty, but I think that when we come back to the building, there's there's going to be thirty percent, twenty percent of people who are just gone. Wow! Just gone. It was too much for them. Their faith was tested. It's kind of like James chapter one. It's like their faith was really tested through this hardship. Twenty wow. percent. I'm, I'm I'm making that number up, right? But that's based on conversations I'm having with people and going, wow, like things have been really hard. And and there was an anti, there was an expectation that things would not be hard. Wow. The expectation that life, and I think what a failing of the American church, what a failing of our congregations to have, and maybe it's not us, but I'm taking the blame on myself, you know, to not have presented people with this idea that life is terrible, (laughs) that people are malevolent, that, that, that things are torturous, that that's the way life is, but you can still have faith. And I think we didn't even know what faith meant 
before all of this, like faith was like going to church, you know, now it's faith is like being able to still breathe and thank God for the nothingness. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I'm grateful for this time because it's exposing us. It's kind of like a wildfire, you know, it's like, it's, it's letting it, he's letting it run for a little bit and we're all getting burnt up a little bit. And, 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 and some of us will go like, well, why are you doing this God? And like, you're dirt and I'm dirt born from the ground. Like we deserve death. A little wildfire is fine. You know, like, <laughs> like, like, so so I don't know. I'm, I'm grateful for this time, even though I, 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 I do sympathize with those who have, who have really have lost jobs, who have lost loved ones. And I go, wow, you're, you're going through it. And, mm-hmm. and, and it's more than you can bear, certainly. Um, but it's an opportunity for you to lean, for you to lean on Christ a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, been, it's, been, it's been incredibly challenging. It's been crazy challenging for ministers. They're trying to learn to preach with nobody there. Um, they're, they're trying to learn to counsel over the phone and over Zoom. They're, we're, you know, we're doing all this stuff and it's, it's really bizarre. I haven't seen, I've talked to so many ministers this year who are like, I am burnt out. Yes. Um, and it's hard. It's hard for everybody. But I'm like, what did you expect? You know, like, <laughs> life is hard. You promised in yeah. this life you will have trouble. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. So tell me, okay. So let's think past 2020 and yeah. hopefully, you know, like, you know, uh, you know, those who, who, you know, I don't know if this is kind of like dark, but it's almost like, um, when God did something amazing, they were like, you know, stones of remembrance. Yeah. And it's almost like we're going to have like scars of remembrance this year. Mm-hmm. Um, where we're going to be able to look down and be like, yep, made it through though. Um, but like, let's say like we're going into 2021, um, like, what do you, where do you, uh, dream? What's your dream for the church? Cause you're, I mean, you're young. How old are you? I'm 32. Wait, I don't know, man. I, okay. keep like, I think I'm 32. <laughs> okay, I think I'm like 32. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but like, you're young, like you've got young kids and they're adorable because your son was uh, dunking. I was watching. I was like, what the heck? He started walking like last week. <laughs> like, what is going on? So I was like, dang, like the competition is starting. I, I don't even have kids. I'm not even married, but I'm like, one day when I have like my kids, I'm like, you're going to learn how to dunk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, the, his first birthday present was like a, a basketball hoop and a, and a ball so you can learn to dunk because I'm all about basketball. I love it. So, so he's like, he's dominating and he makes it and he goes, woo. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's so good. Oh my gosh. I'm like crying. Um, so, okay, like going into the, you know, because I know, you, like, for example, Will, Will Archer, he's going to, I'm going to have him on the podcast here soon. And his whole thing is the next 10 billion or something like that. Um, yeah. He's like, right. we, fo- we focus on the 8 billion. I love it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So with our church, our fellowship of churches specifically, like what, what, where do you feel like we need to be um, in order to, um, you know, a, a, attract or I don't even know if attract is the right word, but to, um, to connect with the next 8 billion. Yeah. So we're in, we're in postmodern world right now. You know, we've, we've, we've kind of entered full, full blown postmodern world. And so, um, so the, the, a, a perfect illustration of this is if you, if you look at the story of John chapter eight, and you go, um, and, and Jesus um, um, kind of um, helping the sinful woman um, there caught in adultery, you know, and he, he, says two things, he says two things to her that are, that are quite profound. Uh, the first thing he says to her is, is um, has, has, no one, has no one condemned you? So neither will I, right? Mm-hmm. That, that picture is very postmodern, right? That's like the postmodern Jesus. Right. The, the second part of that phrase, the second really important thing Jesus says in that story is he goes, now go leave your life of sin. That's right. Go and like, sin no more. Yeah, exactly. So here are these two, these two in apparently competing, uh, competing ideas. Okay. The the go sin no more is like the baby boomer, um, the baby boomer way of of preaching. Maybe even you know like the like that's Billy Graham. You know if you like yep, yep. like like go oh, nah nah it's gonna kill you. You know like. <laughs> They're like blown away. And then, and then being like, God loves you. And like, I don't feel it. You know? Like, so, so, so then you have, then you have kind of like, like the postmodern world, which is like, look, I'm not going to condemn you. Like mm-hmm. who you are is who you are. Right. God loves you anyway. 
you know like that's very attractive you did that very like like hipster minister yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> super attractive right super attractive. so so i don't think in my opinion we will ever be attractive to the postmodern world until we begin to tell the truth mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. and the truth is that you are a terrible sinner yeah and i am a terrible sinner and yeah. you and i have both been trying to figure out life on our own mm-hmm. we have been consuming gross just absolutely f- like foul stuff mm-hmm. we're all corrupted it's all terrible we've tried social media influencer thing all every one of us has tried to make a youtube channel we tried to have clout like every one of us has tried to figure out how to how to make it on our own and the fact is we cannot make it because we're not that special yep our parents told us we were awesome we're not even that awesome like we're we're kind of like average joe stinkers you know like all of us yeah and and we have to start telling the truth because i don't think we're telling you Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like you can do whatever you want to do. Like, that's just not even true. Like, you can't do whatever you want to do. Like, like you could be in the NBA. You're like, I'm five foot seven. You're like, you could still do it. You know, like, there's this spirit. Oh, no. That's crazy. That's from kind of our postmodern, you know, like, you know, you know, getting the, the seventh play trophy thing that everybody jokes about. And, and all that stuff is, is like that, that, no, I won't condemn you thing. We, but we have to figure out how to keep that spirit of Jesus who goes, you know what? I accept you. I accept you. I accept you. I love you. I want to be your father. Mm -hmm. However, you can't live the way you're living. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. You just can't do it. You know, as much as I know, it's been ruining your life. Yeah. Well, and the crazy thing is like, there is no other part of our lives that doesn't have, every relationship is conditional. I mean, our relationship with gravity <laughs> is conditional. Like, like it, it, is, it is the natural part of just the world and how it works. Uh, there are limitations, there are boundaries, there are parameters, uh, there are, and it's, it's so funny because it's like the same worldview of in my religious spiritual life, you know, whatever that may be, um, there are no parameters, there are no boundaries, there are no rules to that. But then the moment you take that same philosophy and you put it with uh, football, <laughs> and it's like, you know, what's his name? Uh, the quarterback. Um, There's a million of them. Tom Brady. Tom Brady, know. there you go. Yeah, well, you know, he's just, he's the only one. But, <laughs> 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 but with like the whole Patriot deflate gate whole thing, like people are running it up for, like, and it's just like, it's so interesting how we're so inconsistent. And I do agree with you. I think that people are looking for, because especially in a Western culture where, um, you know, you, you can listen to politics and, and, and people will defend their actions and say things like, you know, we operated within the bounds of the law. Mm. But then the problem is, is that you created those laws <laughs> to yeah. begin with. And so, yeah. And, and if those things are subjective, then what is, what can we stand on? Yeah, I'm, we're, we're in a really bizarre world right now because everything is being, and I think, you know, I shouldn't say we're in a bizarre world. We're actually in a great world because we're having the opportunity to test everything. Mm-hmm. All the notions that we had before are being tested now. And it's a really good thing. It's going to require additional education in terms of us reading the scriptures being deep into it and and really diving in and studying it out but it's a good thing which is awesome and so like like things i don't want things to get back to normal i want things to be uprooted and questioned and, and we need to talk about it but like we're having to discuss now why our stance on let's say lgbt issues are mm-hmm. are the stance like we have to go back look at the scriptures and mm-hmm. come with the truth yes not come with what the world has told us to say Yep. And, and, and I think we need to have a conversation. You know, I love Guy Hammond, one of my, one of my heroes. He doesn't even know he's a hero of mine, but he's a hero of mine because here's a guy who is both saying, God can accept you. It's the John A. principle. God loves you. However, you need to leave your life of sin. I think yes. we need to do that. And we're so afraid. Even right now, like, you know, people are listening to the podcast. They're like, oh, like I'm so uncomfortable. And I'm like, I'm not uncomfortable. Like, that's just Jesus. <laughs> we can have the conversation. Like, yeah. You mean like with the whole LGBT thing? 
Yeah, like with that or with anything else, honestly. Yeah, no, I, I even with the the rape stuff, like we oh have to have gosh. about it. The political stuff, we have to have a discussion about it. We, That's right. We can't decide that the world is going to dictate what we think about these things. That's right. Back to that first thought. Not very many of you should be teachers, mm-hmm. and I'm not. I should even be a teacher, but we need to figure it out. We need to go back, look at the scriptures, be thoughtful in our approach to these things. Mm-hmm. I think until we start telling the truth, like our, we're going to, the issue is a lot of people who are my demographic and maybe even younger than me are going to get into the pulpit and start just saying whatever people want to hear. Really? Like, you believe that's where we're? I, I think that's, I think that's the worst of where we're going. Okay. I think the best of where we're going is we're going to meet this beautiful balance. Mm-hmm. I don't think we're going to be tempted to go back to baby boomer thing. I don't think so because that's just not us. Like my, my that's you're not going our, to hell because you wouldn't have Bible talk. <laughs> that's not our demographic. Right? That's not just that's not what we do. I don't think that that's. What I think more than likely what's going to happen is that you're going to start seeing the church not grow the way you want it to grow, mm-hmm. and say how do we get people to come, and mm-hmm. then the. Oh, um, maybe our, we should stop talking about this or that or whatever. And I, I see that in the evangelical world. I see that in, in some regards in our, in our world and, and mm. all of these piffy statements that rhyme, you know, like my whole preaching style is just going to be rhyming words. <laughs> as long as they rhyme, it means something. Honestly, yeah. I'm saying way too many things. You, Kayla, you drew me in. You did the wrong. <laughs> that's, what, that's how you know I'm good. <laughs> that's great. No, that's great. I mean, yeah, I, I, you know, I really, um, I'm really interested to see, you know, I, I know that like our, our fellowship, for example, um, my understanding is that we have like a leadership shortage. And I think kind of what you were saying, even just about driving people in based off of truth, I think that there's, there's a correlation even with that in what will drive t- people even to wanting to serve. So tell me a little bit about kind of your background and what, I mean, you're a young, the average American that is like you, a young millennial guy who's like talented and all these kinds of things, you're probably maybe not married yet. Um, you're probably really successful in your career at whatever that may be. Um, and maybe you're starting to think about kind of like settling down or something like that. Yeah. Um, and so what in your life has led you, oh, sorry, stuff in my office is going around. What in your life has led you to be where you are right now? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I owe a lot. That's like of, a huge question, but you know. I owe a lot of, I mean, 99.99999% of this stuff to, to the idea that I'm, um, blessed by God, <laughs> that yeah. I, the secular term lucky, um, to use a biblical term, you know, like, uh, like God has been sovereign in my life. Mm. Um, he's, he's uh, like, that's really what I owe it to primarily. Um, but, I, but I do also, um, I think about, um, I was given an opportunity, mm-hmm. I was given an opportunity and I was given an opportunity, um, with the understanding that, that I was going to fail. Mm. And, by who, whose whose expectation was that? I think I think it was never spoken, but but the elders um, here that that it was going to be okay that I couldn't accomplish everything um, that I uh, that that I wouldn't accomplish everything they dreamed of, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think that that freedom has given me the confidence to be what I believe is best, mm-hmm. um, and to do what I believe is best, and to and to sit at their feet when I need to, and to ask really difficult questions about difficult subjects, about everything that we believe as a church, and, and to go mm. to, to, the, to brothers and sisters and ask questions about why we do what we do. And, um, and I, I feel like that has been, if we could get into a place where we start um, doing that for, for young guys, um, giving them a chance, um, mm. a fail while also being kind of a safety net for them, I think, I think we can see a, a, a lot of young guys who are, who are excited about so uh, I have drive or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. I have a drive. So, and I think a lot of people in my demographic have that same drive, mm-hmm. but they're, they're just driven for, they're driven for notoriety. They're driven for something. They, they're drawing, they're trying to find something greater. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the disciples want it in the church. 
they're looking for it in the church. They're like, give me a shot and I'll do it. But, but I think sometimes the older generation can be so cautious um, mm-hmm. that, it, that, it, that it may be um, because they've, they've seen kind of what that looks like for young guys to come in and kind of try to blow the whole thing up or whatever. Um, <laughs> they can just be a little cautious. And, and yeah. so I think if we could have them, uh, and I, I say this with all due respect, but have them be a little bit more faithful um, mm-hmm. to people, but to God. Um, during those moments, I, I think we could see um, things that we've never seen before. I, I'm I'm praying that people that I'm raising up are like ten times better than me at this stuff. Yeah, yeah. That they're way more visionary. That they're way more inspired. That they're that they're way more biblically literate. That they that they just have these deep convictions about life. I'm praying that that's the case. Um, that that's that they are, that, that are able to to teach and preach and move our our movement forward. Because I still believe in this idea of this collective of churches that we have. I love it. Mm-hmm. So. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I got my start. I was believed in, and I think that's what I'm trying to do to kind of raise some, some more people up. I know it's not very practical, but that's kind of the way I think about it. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like you even, you grew up in the church, right? Yeah. I think I was nine years old when uh, my dad got baptized. I was going to say, when you got baptized, we were like, dang. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, infant baptism. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So you were then, you were kingdom kid. Yeah, I, I would say I would say I'm a kingdom kid. Okay, yeah. and how did that? How did that? Okay, so it's kind of cool that you you know you you grew up maybe not going to church at some point and then and then started going to church. How yeah. did that impact your? Because at nine years old, people don't give kids enough credit. You start to form your worldview quite early on. Yeah, you know it's funny because even as you said you're a kingdom kid, I think like n- now I'm like of course I'm a kingdom kid. I'm nine years old, but like <laughs> then I'm like I'm not a kingdom kid. You know like. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I was totally, yeah. Like my view of life was significantly different than, okay. than the other people had in church, than my children will have necessarily. Yeah. So like what, so even like seeing your parents um, make that decision, like how did that, what, what impact did that have on you growing up? So uh, like my, my father often tells me um, that I tell the story wrong, but the way that I think about it is that he had an unhealthy relationship with alcohol. Um, okay. And so that, that relationship with alcohol, like, um, uh, that was um, burned in my cornea. Like I, mm-hmm. I, I saw that. I can see it even even to this day. And so, mm-hmm. um, but but then that stopped. And it wasn't overnight necessarily, but it stopped. And so that that made me think a lot differently about life. The other thing that made me di- think differently is that I went to a church. I'm sorry, I, I was living in New York City, and then I moved um, outside of New York City. And all of a sudden, like most of the people are white, and like not like I was. I was in the city where like you know all my friends were like not white, and yeah. like, the city was like significantly different. Okay. And so there, that also kind of shaped that that like multiculturalism, that idea of like m- many people being together and and like black and white and Spanish all be intermixing me- meant a lot to me even at the young age. And so yeah. those things in um, the church. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I think those That's things cool. craft a lot of the way I think about um, those days. Even though I'm I'm sure you know I mean church our, our church historians will tell you that those days were not may- maybe the nicest days of the world, but but for me they they were. Um, it was, it was wonderful seeing that stuff. And, and obviously the impact that, that Christ had on my dad and subsequently my father and my, my sister and me, um, mm. made a, made a, like, uh, I mean, I'm eternally, literally grateful for it. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing, seeing, uh, yeah, someone turn around and go and walk in a different direction is, uh, that's incredible. That's incredible. Well, <clears throat> Tony, clearly we could continue and go on and on. Obviously, we'll have to have like a part two of this or something. But uh, is there anything that you want to kind of just like get off your chest? I don't know, like share or just look. I, I don't know. See, here's the thing. You know, oh, <laughs> I can get on my. I, I don't know. I I'm so passionate about these things. Yeah. Because I'm I'm because I. I know it sounds so cliche, but I, I love God and his kingdom. Like, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. I, I want to see, I want to see what God can do with us. And, yeah. and that is of, of what we could become. And, um, and I have excitement and I, I view beautifully, like what, what also we could become, you know, it's like, and so I just think uh, conversations like this are, are so important um, for our church to have. And, and I, I appreciate you giving kind of a, a voice to, you know, bringing in some of the church leaders and asking some questions and um, yeah, 
And I, I love you elders. You're amazing. That's it. I'm awesome. done. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Very, uh, very graceful uh, landing there. Um, <laughs> well, you guys, I'm so excited to have um, Tony on this podcast. Um, you have really become one of my big brothers in the faith. And I actually really value my, my big brother relationships um, in life. And so I'm really grateful to have you as a part of it. And you and Cassandra, I actually need to, I'm like interacting with Cassandra, like most on like Facebook with your guys is like, you're amazing, you're cute kids. So, um, but um, I think that I 100% I agree. I feel like the Holy Spirit has been moving and I've, and we're weird with the Holy Spirit. Like it's, it's hard, you know, cause he's, it's not tangible. So podcast girl, <laughs> no, it's all another podcast, but I do feel this, um, stir mm. I do feel this deep stir and I've been feeling it for the last couple of years very distinctly like and so I <clears throat> even I don't even know that COVID is it um but I feel like God there's a it's almost like when the wave first starts but it like was just like that shift that tectonic plate just shifts and then eventually it turns into I don't know what it will be but I am excited and I and my prayer is that whatever it is and whenever it is that we're prepared Amen. for it I'm with you so that's cool well thanks so much Tony where do we find the podcast? Can you tell me? Oh yeah, that's a good, it's going to be on YouTube. You guys, well, hopefully you're watching it on YouTube right now. We're on Zoom right now, but it's going to be on YouTube. So go ahead and subscribe, uh, like, and comment below. Uh, and then I'll also have this up on Spotify. So I'll, any of you guys that are on Spotify, go ahead and follow. And, um, you know, anywhere else you can find podcasts, but YouTube and Spotify, those are the only ones that matter. And iTunes, I guess iTunes counts too. So uh, all the love to iTunes. <laughs> But, you know, Joe Rogan's moving his podcast to Spotify. So that's like the new spot. So you there. Yeah. I don't have a Spotify account. I probably need to. I'm a yeah, boomer. I should totally have a Spotify account. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining and listening. Um, tune in next week for episode three with I don't know quite yet who the podcast guest is going to be, but you'll find out soon. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Tony.